Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Come with me as we step into the deep, dark forest of fear and let us pray we see sunrise in the morning. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. Without further ado, let's get into tonight's story, entitled Fighting for my life on the Black River. Let's get straight into that. It can't happen to me. We've all thought it at some point in our lives. We see something on the news, something terrible, a terrible tragedy, and think to ourselves, not me. That could never happen to me. Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but it can. Mine wasn't a news report, though I have thought it then too. But while watching some scary movies, a creature feature, it wasn't the usual way of thinking, the phrase though. I didn't think such things could happen to me because of my life. It was too boring for such things. I thought I'd never have something so exciting happen. Oh, how I wish I could take it all back. First, let me tell you a little bit about myself so you kind of understand my mindset at the time. I was in my early 30s, single, overweight, had constant car trouble. I worked a job I hated and lived with my mother. I struggled with depression and a severe lack of interest in things I normally loved. Yes, I frequently had those kind of thoughts but never acted on them. I wasn't in a hurry to kick it but living was becoming exhausting. After a year and a half of barely any downtime from work, I managed to find someone to take my place for a week so I could go on a vacation. A trip to the deep woods, as it were. I've always loved the outdoors, though I don't get out as much as I'd like, and consider myself kind of a lazy outdoorsman. By that I mean, I rarely camp more than one or two nights at a time, and I haven't been on many long hikes. Most of this is due to my size. I'm a big guy, and years of bad habit pop in my knees when they get stiff, have cut my long distance or rough terrain walks even more. However, I don't let it completely stop me, and I made plans for this camping trip on some land to which I can neither give the exact location to nor tell the names of my connections for privacy's sake. What I will say is that it is in the mid-southeastern part of North Carolina on the Black River in the densely wooded area. It had been some time since my last camping trip. Work had been stressful and I just needed to get away for a while. And though it was hunting season, I wasn't hunting. This was purely a camping trip with some hiking and fishing. That being said, I'm not dumb enough to go deep into the woods without a weapon. I was taking my AR-15, my Beretta M9 and a Mosin Nagant, to which I had some surplus steel core rounds. Again, not for hunting, but maybe some target shooting once I was away from the usual hunting areas, so not to spook off the game from those that were hunting. I also had my K-Bar heavy bowie knife and a steel bladed spear, and to answer the question, no, I wasn't going to be lugging all of this around on a hike. My plan was to camp for five to seven days in a camper I had recently finished putting together. This gave me a day or two before to pack and prepare, and a day or two after to recoup from my adventure. The trip would consist mostly of hanging out in one area. I'd set up a main campsite off of one of the lesser used trails, right alongside the river that my vehicle could travel down. After a day there, I would leave my base camp, hike out a few miles deeper into the forest with my AR, pistol, the spear and my kit to stay overnight, and then come back for some relaxation, pleasure shooting and generally enjoying the wilderness. Now this isn't by any stretch a tough outing, compared to most of the more rugged outdoorsmen, moving for the weekend as someone once put it. But for me, it was more than I had done before, and I wanted to prove to myself that I could hack it. The first day went by without anything out of the ordinary happening. I established a campsite in a small clearing on the edge of the river. As I had planned, cut and stacked wood for a fire once I had returned from the overnight hike, 
and set up my 7x8 foot camper, this being its maiden voyage. I had two weeks worth of dried and canned food stowed away in sealed containers in case a hungry raider came sniffing around, as well as several cases of water. It was late afternoon at this point, and so I started preparing supper. I kicked back in my camping chair and watched the dark water of the river flow by. I had seen a fish break the surface now and then, watched a squirrel scurry about making his own preparations for winter. I even caught a glimpse of a big buck slowly making its way down a game trail on the other side of the river. Part of me regretted not getting game tags and making this a hunting trip, since this was the biggest buck I'd ever seen. Alas, it was just as nice to see it and take a couple of pictures for proof. It was getting pretty dark, and the only light now coming from the small fire I had made. I decided I'd better turn in for the night, as early as it was at the time, since I was going to be getting up early to better prepare camp. After cleaning up any food and locking up my car as well as putting out the fire, I was ready for bed, and it didn't take me long to get to sleep. It must have been around 3am when I woke up to a strange sound. No, the lack of sound that was the strange part. It was dead quiet. I hadn't closed the thick inner door to allow fresh, cool night air in while I slept. This also let me fall asleep to the sounds of the forest. The silence was what woke me, and I sat up groggily and peeked out of the screen of the camper door. I knew that when things got quiet, there had to be a predator around. The area was lit up under the moon, but I couldn't see anything of note, and then something moved. A black mass slowly made its way around the edge of the clearing, hugging the tree line. It was maybe three or four feet in height, walking on all fours, and was a bit bulky from what I could tell. My heart nearly leaped out of my chest as I thought I was staring at a black bear not but a few yards from my camper. It was partly fear and partly excitement as I'd never seen a full-grown black bear up close before. It made the huffing sniffs and walked similar to the way I'd seen the move on TV, but seeing one, live, in person, while I'm miles from help, nearly made me crap my pants. I had taken proper food storage protocols, keeping camp clean and tidy, and so I was sure. It was just curious of the new smells of my car and camper. However, it wandered off and soon the sounds of the forest returned. I shut the inner door though and laid back down, thinking of how I'd have a hell of a story to tell the next day when I called in for a checkup. Well, somehow I managed to go back to sleep for a few hours and got up with my alarm just before dawn. My plans to stay a full day before going for the hike were kicked to the side as I was eager to get moving. Even my knee seemed to be cooperative as it didn't hurt or even ache. Now the thought of what if I had waited comes to mind. Stepping out of the camper, I stretched and made a quick breakfast. As I sat in my chair eating, I remembered the bear I'd seen the night before. And once I'd finished eating, took out my phone and took pictures of the tracks as proof. That's when I saw I had almost no signal. Something I hadn't thought of before, since I'd always had signal at other campsites that were on the property. Maybe I was just out of range. I thought to myself as I sent a text letting everyone know I was okay, despite seeing a bear the night before, and would send pictures when I could. I knew it would take a while to send, but it didn't matter much. I made my way over to where I'd seen the animal walk by and pulled up the camera on my phone. When I found the tracks, my brow furrowed. These weren't bear tracks. As I'd seen bear tracks before, no, these were canine tracks. Big canine tracks. Eastern NC does have red wolves, but the animal I'd seen was no wolf. It was too big, much too big to be a wolf. My blood ran cold as I tried to think of a rational reason for the size of these tracks. I mean, they were almost as big as my own boot prints. Instantly, I thought of some giant wolf-like creature was out here with me. I almost packed up camp right there and then, but another thought hit me. This was a prank. Yeah, it had to be. I was always open about the fact that I believe most, if not all, of the creatures and cryptids did in fact exist. Someone, most likely my older brother, had put on a good show and made these tracks with some boot cast attachment, just to mess with me. Yeah, yeah, 
I rolled my eyes, settling on this being the best case, and sent another text. Ha ha, very funny. You had me for a minute there, you ass. I then put my phone away. I gathered my things and locked down the camper and car as best I could, and let the memory fall to the back of my mind as I started off into the forest, having no clue about the hell that I was about to go through. Because, after all, it can't happen to me. The hike, the how, and the eyes. I was probably half a mile, maybe more, from base camp when I realised something. I had forgotten my spear, which made me curse under my breath. Why had I brought the spear in the first place? Bears, of course, or any other predator I'd need to defend myself against. I'm not saying I had the fortitude it would take to stand off with a bear, or whatever, with nothing but a spear. It was a last resort if the sound of a gun didn't scare it off, or kill it if I had to shoot. Figuring I'd be okay without it, and not wanting to backtrack, I continued on. My knee was still holding up and I didn't want to put the extra distance on it in case I had a flare-up. So I let it go and went back to focusing on my surroundings. The fall leaves made the forest glow in a fiery orange. A few residual splotches of green here and there from the trees that refused to surrender their winter slumber. Naturally, it wasn't as noisy as it was at night, but there were birds chirping away and squirrels skittering about. I even caught sight of a small herd of deer across the river, freezing in my place so I wouldn't spook them off. I smiled, taking a moment to admire them from afar, only raising my rifle to get a better look through the scope. I saw the same buck as the day before, and it was tempting to take a shot at it. I mean, who would know this far out and the meat would be good eating for the rest of my trip? I thought better of it though, since it was against my moral fibre to do such a thing. I lowered my rifle and started to turn, when a flash of black zipped by and a doe vanished. The commotion sent the rest of the herd bolting as screams and growls echoed off the walls of the river bank. It was a horrible sound as the doe seemed to plead for mercy only to fall silent after a loud splotching noise, presumably having its throat torn out. I stared, wide-eyed as I scanned the area, looking for where the doe had been carried off to. The rustling of the brush gave me a place to focus on, and I waited to see if anything showed itself. But whatever it was, was content in staying hidden as it devoured its meal. As exhilarating and somewhat frightening as this had been, I took solace in that whatever it was had just fed, and so it probably wouldn't be out looking for more food. I slowly started off again, keeping quiet so not to draw attention to myself. Once I was sure I was out of earshot, I returned to my regular pace and decided to go a bit further than originally planned, just to put some extra distance between me and the beast that ate the dough. After a couple more hours of walking, my knee decided it had enough for the day, and so I began looking for a good spot to hold up for the night and settled on a small clearing about half the size of base. Toughen it out a little bit longer, I began preparing for my overnight stay. And with the ground clear of debris and a decent stack of wood gathered, I made a small fire and set up my hammock. Giving it a test sit, I bared my full weight on what was to be my bed. It held, so I remained there to give my knees some time to stop throbbing so badly. Once it had calmed down a bit, I gathered some more wood, built up a fire and boiled some water for some mac and cheese. This was to go with a pre-made sandwich and a bottle of water. After this late lunch or early supper, I checked my phone to see that I had no service. I was annoyed, though not surprised that my last text hadn't even been sent. This was the price you paid for going out into the deep woods, where coverage was limited. Not wanting to waste battery power, I put it away in my pack, sat on a stump and poked at the fire for a while as the sun fell. I took out a small snack to tie me off until morning, and started mentally preparing myself for bed. I built the fire up a bit more, setting the bigger logs so that they would feed the fire without me having to get up. I left the stump I was sitting on for use in the morning and settled into my hammock. My phone buzzed twice, having turned it on vibrate earlier in the day, and I saw that I had a new text message. Mine had finally sent, and my brother, having better signal where he was, had replied. What? What are you talking about? 
truck's down, so we haven't made it out yet. My brow raised at this, and I scoffed. <laughs> yeah, right. One of y'all snuck out to my camp last night. Uh, he tried to scare me. Where'd you get the giant wolf track attachment for your shoes? I replied, seeing that I had a couple of bars as long as I stayed still. <laughs> my phone buzzed again. Wolf tracks? What are you talking about? Like I said, the truck is down, so I've been here for the last couple of days trying to fix it before I have to go to work tomorrow, he replied. I had barely finished reading it when he sent me a pic of his truck. The hood was up and the motor was all but taken apart from the look of it. It was then that the night was silenced by a long drawn out howl. My eyes went wide as they could and goosebumps crept over my whole body. I dropped my phone as I jumped at the same time and scrambled to pick it back up before the signal cut out again. Too late. The bars dropped off and no matter how I held it, they wouldn't come back. My mind was split in two at this moment. Part of it was trying to get the phone to work again and the other part was trying to figure out what I had just heard. It wasn't the yipping yowl of coyotes. <laughs> no. This was a wolf howl. And worse yet, it had sounded close. Had it been a wolf that had took the deer earlier? One would have been that bad, since it had most likely run off at the sound of a rifle, and the 556 rounds that I had surely could kill it if I had no choice but to shoot. However, a pack, that would be another story. It howled again, though it hadn't seemed to move from its previous position. The sound it echoed around me, reverberating off the wall of trees for what seemed like an eternity. Really. It was probably only a few seconds. As it faded, I remained as silent as the rest of the forest, the crackling fire being the only thing that I could hear, along with the pounding of my heart. There was no reply, which made me glad and sad. This poor creature was all alone out here, not the way a wolf is meant to live. I felt sorry for it, even though it could potentially kill me, especially if it was the same thing that had visited my previous camp. I had accepted by this point that it had been not a prank, but a very large wolf that I'd seen, and while I was terrified, I kind of wanted to see it. Thinking back on it now, I really was a dumbass. The forest came alive once more, crickets, frogs and such, and with their return my heart slowed with ease that I hadn't expected. And with another deep breath, I closed my eyes again. Sleep came quickly and it was quite restful considering what I'd just experienced. I shifted a little to get more comfortable, my eyes cracking open a little as I did. I had to force myself not to flinch as I thought I'd seen a pair of eyes looking at me from across the camp. They'd shown bright green and yellow as the flames danced and reflected off them. The same huffing sniffs as the first night could be heard over the crackling of the fire. I thumbed the safety, hoping it would switch to fire without a sound. I was in luck, but if I had to drop the slide, it was sure to make a sound. I slowly opened my eyes a bit, and it was still there, its form hidden in the shadow, but its eyes and the plumes of vapour made as it breathed in the cold night air, giving away its position. I wasn't sure what to do, though I hoped it would just go away on its own. When it noticed me looking at it, it let out a low growl. I could barely hear it over the pounding of my heart, but it sounded like more of a warning than a threat. I raised the rifle and dropped the slide with an audible clank, pointing in its direction. Leave! Go on now! Get! I shouted and I swore. It laughed. I aimed down into the fire and squeezed the trigger. I'm not sure if it was the rapport of the rifle or the fact that I sent smouldering embers scattering into its direction, but it did, in fact, leave. I got up and shouldered my weapon, ready in case it came back, but there was nothing. I stamped out the embers I could see, so as not to spark a forest fire. I got out my flashlight and shone it around once, twice, and more, but there was still nothing. I went over to where it had been standing and looked around, nearly pissing myself when I saw the same tracks as before. I looked to where I had seen the eyes, gauging its head height at no less than four and a half feet off the ground. Definitely not a red wolf, and most likely not a bear. I'm going to be fully honest here. Whereas I had almost pissed myself before, 
I actually did now. I hadn't thought of it before, but where there had been silence during my encounter, now there were crickets chirping and an owl hooted somewhere close by. Maybe it had gone far away. Psh, I wasn't taking the chance. I packed up camp right then and there, but knew better than to go off into the night. Instead, I tossed on a few more logs and checked my phone. I huffed when I saw it was only 2am and I still had no signal. Fuck. I said out loud, putting the phone away. I built two more fires near the edge of the clearing and sat on the stump right in the middle. I'd watch one way for a while, keeping my head on the swivel and switching directions every so often. This was going to be a long night. The feeling of being hunted. By the time the sun had come up, my eyes were heavy but remained wide and active. The sounds of the forest came and went all through the night, as well as the sniffing or huffing of the beast. It was as if it was probing my defences, or lack thereof, or doing it simply for the entertainment of scaring me over and over again. And once the sun had risen enough for me to see a good ways off, I put out the fires and started back to the way I had come the day before. I tried my best to double time, but that meant straining my knee more than usual, which meant the pain would return quicker. Ignoring it was easy, since I had other things to worry about. The plan was to get back to base camp, jump in my car and haul ass. This meant leaving a camper and everything within, but I could come back for it later, once I had more people. It was a good thing I had stuck to following the river, making it really hard to get lost. All I had to do was keep the water to the opposite side as the day before, and then within a few hours I'd be back and on my way out of here. Even though I could hear the birds and other creatures stirring about as they got started for the day, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every now and then, I'd catch a glimpse of something jump from behind one tree or bush to another, and I could only assume it was my late night visitor. I never stopped though, figuring if I did, it might seize the opportunity to strike. I could only imagine that this is how prey animal felt when it was being chased. I turned just in time to see a mass of fur and fang charging straight at me. It wasn't waiting for me to stop. I turned, took aim and fired. Bang, bang, bang. Three quick shots. The first shot was dead on, striking it on its left side, but the other two were high as its front leg buckled for a moment. It closed the remainder of the distance with a leap and paused that looked more like hands outstretched with a mouth wide open. My dumb luck kicked in and I tripped over a root, falling just under its grasp. The momentum of its jump sent it over the edge of a high bank and into the black water beyond. I sprang to my feet and took off, not waiting to see if it was climbing back up or not. I could hear it growling and barking in frustration as it splashed into the water. Glancing back, I almost laughed as it leapt from the water and clung to the near vertical wall of the river bank only for the dirt and roots to give way and send it back into the drink. I wasn't completely lucky though. When I had tripped over the root, I landed on my bad knee. Jolting it hard, but in the moment I hadn't noticed. Now it was hurting and my limp made progress slow. Still, I managed to make it back to camp and hadn't heard from my furry friend since. I stopped, hearing it struggle to free itself from the river there was something wrong with the camper. I was looking at the roof vent, which meant it had been pushed over. Besides being flipped onto its side, it was relatively intact. I turned to my car, hoping it had fared better, but it had not. All of the tyres were slashed and the hood was peeled back like a tin can. Looking over the motor, I scoffed as I knew there was no hope for it. If it had just been the tyres, I could have drove it out. Rims be damned. My knee was throbbing and I knew it didn't have much left to give me in the way of walking out of the woods. I checked my phone again to see if maybe, by some miracle, I had enough signal to call for help. I broke down in a sob as I read, no service. A howl led out some ways back and I jumped, spinning around and falling on my ass. I scrambled to my feet and shouldered my rifle, looking back the way I had just come from. There, about 60 yards away, it stood. 
but not on all fours that I'd seen it before, but upright on its hind legs. Werewolf, I said to myself, later correcting myself as Dogman once I'd done some research. It was about seven to eight feet tall, and its dark brown and black fur was still wet from its bath. At this point, I knew that I had just one choice. I had used up flight. It was time to fight. Fight for survival. I dropped to one knee, my good one, to better study my aim and unleashed fury. I fired a few rounds, strafing its torso and then re-aiming. When the first mag was empty, I slapped in the second and in no time at all, I was reaching for the third. The pouch it was supposed to be in was empty. Probably had fallen out when I tripped before. To my surprise, it was still standing there. Just standing there. It looked down at its chest and brushed it with the back of its clawed hand like one would shoo away a bug. I doubt I hit it with every round, but the ones that had hit it had done nothing more than be a minor irritant. It held out its arms and cocked its head to the side. It was a stance that said, Is that all you got? My gaze narrowed and I looked to the camper. The door was hanging open, so without looking away from the monster before me, I reached inside until I felt the stock of my mossin and the shaft of my spear. I slid both out but picked up the rifle first, leaving my AR resting against the wall and stepped back over to where I had a clear shot. You want more? I yelled and checked that the chamber had a round in it. I lifted the heavy weapon, I aimed for the mouth and fired, hoping to wipe that grin, yes grin, off its face. The rifle bucked as the round flew down range and struck it right between the eyes. And since I hadn't accounted for bullet climb, its eyes went wide as it yelped and stumbled back, grabbing its forehead. The steel core round had done something, at least. It looked up at me with hatred and anger that I had managed to hurt it. Quickly, I chambered around and fired. As I did, it dropped to all fours and the shot went high. It sprinted towards me and I sent another round to meet it, buckling its right arm and making it stumble, but nothing more. I didn't have time for another round as it was almost on me and so I stood and swung the rifle like a club up and over my shoulder and bringing it down just in time to catch it on top of the head. The butt of the rifle shattered on impact but it did its share of damage as the beast dropped and rolled, knocking my legs from under me and sending me arse overhead in the other direction. It got to all fours as I rolled to my knees and scrambled to draw my pistol. Now point blank range, I fired it, trying to hit it in the eyes, if for nothing else but to blind it. It yipped and yelped when I made a sensitive hit, but otherwise I wasn't having much luck since it was shaking its head. I assume it was still dazed from the clubbing, which gave me time to empty my Beretta. There was a fire in my side now as I looked down and saw red. Apparently it had caught me with a claw in our roll, but it wasn't a major wound and there was no real pain yet, just heat. With a pistol empty, I reached for my bowie. Gone! Shit! I exclaimed as I tried to think of what to do next. The wolf looked at me now, having gotten over most of the dizziness, and snarled. It was covered in blood, but it was its own, as it had yet to tear into me. I breathed heavily as we circled each other, me stepping towards the camper, and it following my steps. It swiped, but missed. Snapped, but it was white. I noticed one of its eyes had been damaged and the other was coated in blood. My foot was hit with something and I glanced down. My spear! With a grin I picked it up and unsheathed the foot long blade with a nice shing and pointed it at the wolf. Don't suppose you want to call it a draw? I asked, not knowing if it understood me or not, but if it turned and ran, I'd let it. It snorted and whipped its head to the side and back growling and turning to advance on me. I backed up straight now, edging closer to the bank. Like the place it had gone over before, there was a steep drop into deep water. I hoped that I could send it in there again, giving me time to breathe and make a better strategy, or in the least, put some distance between me and it. It saw this and stopped its advance, narrowing one of its good eyes at me. 
and then rose to its full height again. It raised its head and let out a howl. Big mistake. I charged forward and jabbed hard with the spear, the blade piercing through its skin and gliding between its ribs as I gave it a little twist. The howl turned to a yelp and a snarl as it hit me hard, sending me flying as I slammed into the front wall of my camper. This knocked the breath out of me and left me with four slashes across my stomach and chest, turning the front of my ragged shirt a darker colour. As I tried to catch my breath, I saw it stumbling a little, the spear still stuck in its side. It seemed to be having trouble breathing now, and it grabbed the shaft and yanked it out. I grinned and coughed as I saw the blade had remained in a wound, catching on the rib cage and allowing the pole to be moved since I had never permanently fastened it on with screws it came with. The hole in the spearhead allowed blood to flow freely and the sharp edges doing even more damage each time it tried to take a breath. It stumbled again, gasping and then dropping to all fours, crawling away towards the river. I doubt it even knew which way it was going as it toppled over the edge and rolled into the water with a splash. I got to my feet and walked over to where it had fallen in, but I didn't see anything other than the water settling back into its normal pace. I made my way back over to my camper, climbed inside with a spear shaft, my AR and pistol, reloading them just in case. I sat against the back wall with my guns and a bottle of water, looking at my phone, which, for whatever reason, had full bars. I rolled my eyes and scoffed before dialing my brother's number and telling him I needed help. That was the last thing I remember until I woke up in hospital a few days later, bandaged from the head to toe as I had all manner of cuts and bruises. They said I'd been attacked by a bear and was lucky to be alive, but I knew better. I also knew better than to try and convince them otherwise lest I might meet the guys in white coats. I healed over the coming weeks and found out that my brother had repaired my car and brought it to my camper home. He told me he had found my lost mag and Bowie, but hadn't seen my spear blade. It didn't matter though, as I could order a new one. The following year, I returned to the campsite where I had nearly lost my life in a battle with a dogman. Through what I had gathered, it was a young and rambunctious one and was mostly toying with me. That had been its downfall. Had it been older or more experienced, I wouldn't be here to write this, yet here I am. As I looked around the area, something caught my eye and made me raise a brow. Jammed in a tree at the river's edge was my spear blade. In the distance, I heard a howl. Fighting for my life on the Bladen Lakes. The return to Black River. Let's get straight into that. After my fight with the dogman, I was in hospital for several days due to my injuries and loss of blood. I pulled through and after several weeks laid up at home, I was well enough to move about more freely. I still bear the scars and have a permanent limp but for the most part I have moved on with my life. I still love the outdoors, camping, hiking, hunting and fishing, though rarely alone and never without a high powered rifle on hand. You know as they say about falling off bikes and horses, you just gotta get back on. On that note, when the anniversary of my encounter came up I decided I would slip back out there, even though it was off limits by everyone but the landowners. I figured I'd get some form of closure and could relax more when I found myself out in the wilderness. So, I grabbed a couple of guns and headed out for what was to be a very short visit, maybe a few minutes at most. As I pulled into the clearing, I stopped and gripped the steering wheel nervously. I was considering turning around right then and there and leaving. No, I had to do this. And so, I psyched myself up and opened the door, stepping out and taking a deep breath. I stayed by the open door to my car and listened. I could hear the normal sounds of birds chirping and squirrels rustling. I relaxed a bit and figured all was well and stepped away from my car, shutting the door. I walked over to where my camper had been flipped. My car totaled 
and where my showdown with the Dogman took place. It looked exactly as it had when I first came here, like nothing had ever happened. I touched my chest and felt the thin lumps of scar tissue that ran down my torso, a reminder that it had in fact happened. And finally, I gave a look around the area, glad that I had done this since now I felt more at ease. That feeling went away when I noticed something a bit out of place. Jammed in a tree by the bank of the river was my spear blade. I went over and looked at it closer, noting the rust on the exposed edge before I pulled it from the tree. It was then that a howl split the silence that had fallen over the area. Instantly, I bolted from my car, tossing the blade in as soon as the door opened, followed by myself. I bet he closed the door when the engine roared to life and I was kicking up dirt and dust as I peeled out of there faster than I ever had gone before. My heart raced and the pounding it was making caused my hearing to blot out for a moment as I swerved and swung around the turns of the dirt road. As I reached the blacktop, I looked into my rearview mirror, in time to see a large figure go from all fours to standing upright, only to vanish as a tree broke my line of sight when I turned onto the paved road. The Poacher and the Dogman Mark Wiggins was a 54-year-old divorcee with three kids. He wasn't a particularly great father figure, and had been a worse husband. He fancied himself as a hunter, but the truth was, he was nothing more than a poacher. Lacking decent hunting grounds himself, he took to visiting other people's properties, and to see if he could land a trophy buck and pack his freezer while he was at it. And this year, he found himself in the backwoods of Black River, seeking a bit of land that was well known for big bucks. He'd heard of a bear attack this year before, but he wasn't worried. His only concern was getting caught. He pulled onto a dirt path that seemed to still have some dust settling and hoped he wasn't about to come up on someone already out here. It would be hard to explain why he was in a patch of woods not his own, dressed in a full hunting attire. And to his luck, there was no one there when he pulled into the clearing. His best guess is that whoever had just left must have been out for a morning hunt and had gone for the day. Still, he figured it would be best if he just scouted around and come back another time if he found plenty of sign of game. Once parked by the edge of the river, Mark got out of his pickup and took the rifle from the window rack, loading around into the chamber. Walking around the area, he looked high and low for clues as to where the hunting stand or ground blind might be hidden. He searched for a sign of deer, but there didn't seem to be any around the clearing. Maybe a bit further in, he thought to himself, and found what looked to be a well-worn path heading into the forest. Covering his nose and mouth, he pressed on and found himself stepping out into another clearing. It was half the size of the one he'd left his truck and all around were bones and remains of animals, mostly deer. There also seemed to be remnants of three campfires, long extinguished, but the black patches and charred wood were still there. He thought this was odd, since they were so close together, why would anyone do this? And then he noticed something else. An overturned tree with a hole dug under it seemed to be a lair of whatever had made this place home. Naturally, the stench here was overwhelming. It was at that moment he heard a limb snap somewhere close by, and all other sounds stopped as a low growl rumbled all around him. He clicked the safety off his rifle and took a step back so he could make a hasty retreat, but bumped into something. His face scrunched into confusion as he knew there hadn't been a tree there before, since he was backstepping in his own tracks. Hot stinking breath blew past his head as a growl bellowed right behind him, making him turn around and come face to face with the muzzle of the beast. The dogman roared and Mark screamed, swinging his gun up to fire, but it was knocked away and the shot went wide. At the same time, a clawed hand raked his face and neck, severing his carotid artery and sending a spray of red over the area. Mark collapsed to the ground from the blow and tried to crawl away, his pleading voice distorted and gurgled from blood. The dogman dropped to all fours and stood on the man's back, holding him down as he leaned down and bit into his shoulder, lifting him up and giving him a shake, tearing flesh away before the arm was completely removed at the collarbone. His screams, which barely made it to the clearing he'd parked his truck in, 
soon fell silent when the dogman bit into his neck and crushed his spinal cord in a single crunch. A trip to the Bladen Lakes. I never told anyone about that near miss, as I was technically trespassing. I knew that that would be where the focus was, rather than the fact that the beast was still out there. And besides, no one would believe me anyway. That was several months ago, and since then, I've been camping several times, making it a bi-weekly event. Yet, I never went back to the area where my fight had taken place, or any other part of the river, for that matter. I wasn't going to take the chance of that thing finding me again. Instead, I gave it a wide berth, going to some land owned by a friend of mine, or to the Jones Lake State Park, part of the Bladen Lake State Forest. That was where I was heading for the weekend trip, just after the new year. It was going to be cold, but that was how I liked it. I had taken an extra day off work, so I'd have a three-day weekend. I had plenty of leftovers from New Year's Eve parties, and a cooler of sodas, water, and sports drinks. As a state park, it was open to the public, had established camping spots for rent, and was patrolled by park rangers. The only downside was that firearms were not permitted on the grounds. And despite this being a law, I did keep my refurbished mozzin under the back seat of my car with a box of armor-piercing rounds and, of course, I brought my spear. When I got to the campground, it was completely empty. It seemed that I would have the whole place to myself. I smiled, as the solitude would be a nice change to being around other people. That was soon dashed as a group showed up and set up into the spot right across from mine. I wasn't thrilled by this, but I figured I could just ignore them and hope that they weren't the rowdy type. Howdy, friend! One of them spoke up, crushing the idea of being able to ignore them. I gave a wave and smiled politely, and the man made his way over, introducing himself and his friends. In all, there were seven of them. Two couples. Julie and Robert, Thomas and Sarah. Two single guys, Mike and Keith, who were brothers, and a single girl, Rebecca, or Becca as she liked to be called. It was around that time that the park ranger stopped by to check us in and take payment for the campsites. He informed us that he had drawn the short straw and would be the only one on duty that weekend, but if we needed anything to just call the station. And through the ensuing conversations and observation with my fellow campers, I learned that they were all in their late twenties. The guys were all fit as well as Julie and Sarah. The couples were from well-to-do families, the country club types. The brothers were farm boys, though, if they had worked the fields for more than a day, I'd eat my hat. Becca was more like me, a bit on the heavy side, came from a modest background, and didn't seem to have very much luck with relationships. She didn't really want to come, but was pressured into it by others as a way to get her mind off her most recent ex. I could tell that Mike had a thing for her, but she wasn't into him at all. Eventually, they decided that they had better get their campsite set up and left me alone once again. Forced to leave home. After losing a fight with his alpha, the dogman found himself banished from the pack to find his own territory. He settled on an area with plenty of game and water resources to sustain him. He had discovered a human in his new territory and attempted to kill him. The shot to his head had glanced off or the fight would have ended right then. Now he found himself struggling to get ashore, and finally pulling himself onto the bank. He still couldn't pull the spear blade out. The pain was just too great. Until the object was removed, his healing factor couldn't repair the damage. He passed out, and by the time he had awoken, it was night, and his other wounds were nearly healed. By some miracle, he hadn't died, though he could feel himself getting weaker. On top of that, and the fight, it cost him an eye and his pride. He had been cocky, toying with the human and let his guard down, a mistake he wouldn't make again. He snarled, heading back to find his intended victim and finish the job. And when he got there though, the area was empty. The scent of several humans hung over the clearing and it was obvious that his quarry had been taken away. Part of him hoped that the man had died, thus making him the winner in the end but it also hoped that the human had lived and would return. 
and with a growl he yanked the spear out, yelping as it hurt like hell to do so, and then jammed the blade into the tree. This would serve to be a marker that he was still there, and a reminder of the mistake he had made. He waited for weeks and months, but eventually gave up on the notion that a human would return. Still, this was good hunting grounds, and he was mostly undisturbed, and so he set out to mark his borders. After some time, he had it all but forgotten about the human. He had almost lost his life, too. It was a year later, and he was resting in his den when the wind brought the scent of the human, and his ears perked up. It had been a long time, but he never fully forgotten the smell of him. Stepping out, he gave a sniff. And, in the excitement, he let out a howl. He raced to the clearing, but was too late. A plume of dust was all that was left there, and the chase was on. Taking a shortcut through the woods, he tried to cut the human off but failed to catch up before the car left off onto the Blackstone path and took off. He was fast but not that fast, nor could he hold out the chase for that long with one lung being weaker than the other. He dropped back to all fours and slowly headed for home. The sound of another vehicle caught his attention. As a truck pulled in, following it to the clearing, he watched as an older human got out and headed off into the woods towards his den. After killing this trespasser, he went back and pushed the truck over the edge of the bank and into the deep water in an attempt to hide it. It failed to sink all the way, and a few days later, a fisherman reported it, and Mark's body was discovered soon after. Now, humans were combing the area, and since there were too many for him to fight on his own, he had no choice but to leave. This meant he'd probably never get to exact revenge, but it was better than dying. He headed west, travelling at night when it wasn't likely that he would be spotted. Eventually, finding himself an unclaimed area with several lakes and a vast expanse of forest. Little did he know, he would get another chance to get revenge after all. Campfire Stories it was rather comical watching the others try to set up their tents. The only one that seemed to have a grasp on the idea was Becca, though she was too having a bit of trouble. My camper had a flat tyre and the spare wouldn't hold air, so I was sleeping in a tent with this go-around as well. Mine was up in just a few minutes, so I went over and offered to help them out. Thanks, man. That was mighty kind of you, Keith said with a smile, once we were finished. Ah, no problem. I replied and started to walk away when one of them asked if I could help them with getting a fire going. I thought it odd that they couldn't manage it, but then again, it made sense, given their skill at putting up a tent. They were amazed at how easy it was with a flint and steel and a small amount of tinder. Soon their fire was going good, and I was off to get mine going too. I was later invited over for supper, and though I had planned to eat some leftovers, the smell of the venison stew they were cooking made it hard to resist. I made sure my fire was low so it wouldn't get out of control while I was away and headed over to the site to await supper. Even though alcohol wasn't permitted on the grounds, Mike and Keith had brought some mason jars of homemade moonshine. Hey guys, don't get caught with that. You don't want to get banned. I said and they laughed. Come on man, lighten up. Mike said and held a jar out to me. I put up a hand. <laughs> no thanks, I don't drink. I said. Declining the offer, and everyone looked at me in disbelief. Seriously? Julie asked as she took the glass and sipped from it. Eh, seriously. I don't care for the taste, and I don't see the appeal of getting drunk. I replied with a shrug. The couples and brothers all gave a little laugh. Becca, on the other hand, only smiled in an understanding way. When supper was done cooking, we all fixed our bowls and got sodas from the cooler. There was joking and laughing the whole time we were eating and I was beginning to like this new group of friends. Hey, who's got a scary story? Robert asked, and we were all excited to see who had one to offer. Thomas chimed up and told a paranormal story he'd heard online. I'll admit, it was rather chilling, but I had lived through worse. Sarah was next, but her story was, well, kind of weak, more humorous than scary. What about you? Keith asked, taking me off guard and all heads turned to me. Well, I... I started but pursed my lips. No, I said. 
Oh, come on. You do, don't you? Mike said, excitedly, and everyone else joined in, egging me on. <sighs> and with a heavy sigh, I nodded and started, telling about the fight with the dogman. By the end, everyone was on the edge of their seats, eyes fixed on me. In the distance, I heard a howl. I said as if on cue, a howl was let off from deep in the woods that made the girls and a couple of the guys scream. They all broke out laughing, but I only looked off into the direction it had come from. Could it be? I thought to myself, but it was broken when Becca spoke up. That was good. Thanks, I said with a small smile. Almost sounded real, she replied with a smile that faded. Actually, it was real. That happened about a little more than a year ago, 25 miles east of here on Black River. I said and everyone went silent. Pfft, yeah, right, Robert remarked and everyone except Becca started laughing again. My eyes narrowed as I thought about showing them the scars, but it was probably better that everyone believe it to be just a story. My eyes narrowed as I thought about showing them my scars, but it was probably better that they believe it to be just a story. The Nightmare We all went to bed not long after that, though some of us didn't go to sleep right away. In the relative silence of the night, I could hear at least one of the couples trying to be quiet as they went at it. When they were done, all I could hear were the crickets. I closed my eyes and soon fell asleep. I was awakened some time later to what sounded like sniffing around my tent. Blinking a few times, I quietly got to my knees and lifted my spear from under my covers. A snarl led out behind me and the fabric wall split open. The beast was on me, fangs clamping into my side of my neck before I could even try to defend myself. Blood spurted everywhere as it ripped the flesh from my neck, its clawed hands ripping open with ease. Sitting up, screaming, I drew the spear blade from its sheath and swung at it at the empty space before me. I breathed heavily, sweat beating down my forehead, as I realised it was only a nightmare. Hey, you okay, man? Thomas called out in the dark. Yeah, bad dream, uh, I'm sorry. I replied and laid back down. I didn't sleep well for the rest of the night, tossing and turning under my covers, shivering even though I had plenty of warmth. I gave up just as the sun started filtering through the trees and stepped out into the cold morning air. I jumped when I saw a figure sitting by my fire pit, which had apparently been restarted. It was Becca, and she was wrapped up in a blanket, curled up in my chair. Hey, are you okay? I asked, making my way over to her. She looked up at me, tears in her eyes. Yeah, she lied, wiping her face. I raised a brow and pulled up a stump to sit on. You're sitting at a stranger's fire, crying. What's wrong? I asked again. My boyfriend dumped me last week. Said I was fat and ugly, she said with a shaky voice. My jaw clenched. Sounds like a real charmer. His loss, in my opinion. I said and smiled. She smiled back. So, why are you over here instead of by your own fire? I asked. And she blushed and looked away. Well, to be honest, I was going to slip into your tent last night, but I never just hooked up before, so I chickened out and just sat here. She admitted and I chuckled. I'd have asked you to buy me dinner first, I said, and she broke out into a cute giggle. We talked for a while longer until we heard her friend starting to stir. Figuring she'd better head back before they got the wrong idea, we exchanged numbers and a Facebook info to keep in touch. I smiled at the thought that we might hit it off as more than friends some time later. I fixed my breakfast and ate alone with my lazy neighbours dragging themselves out of bed. We all got together again and hung out that day as well, but they weren't staying a second night. They broke camp and we all said our goodbyes. And just before they piled into their car, Becca ran over to me, giving me a big hug and a light kiss on the cheek. The others awed and awed at her, except for Mike, who gave me a dirty look. While well, I grinned and returned a kiss. As I did, she whispered into my ear, I believe you, and then went on to get in the car. After they left, I was alone once again, which I didn't mind as that had been the plan anyway. The difference now was that I had someone to chat with through texting or messenger. As the sun drifted down, I threw together a quick supper and turned in early, planning to go on a hike in the morning. 
the hike to Salter's Lake. Like the morning before, I got up just as the sun broke through the trees and started breaking camp. I pulled my car into the main parking lot, packing a few sports drinks and a sandwich for lunch when I took a break. I had walked this trail twice before and was looking for a third go at it. I stuck the sheaved spear blade into my pack and carried the pole as a walking stick until I was down to the trail a ways. Locking up my car as I started off, crossing the park area and entering the tree-covered walkway on the left side of the park. If all went well, I'd be coming out on the right side in just a few hours. Once I was down the trail, I slipped my pack off and pulled the blade out, leaving the cover on for safety, and stuck it on the pole. With my pack back on, I was off once more, taking it easy on my knee, which always ached a little since my encounter, but wasn't so bad that I couldn't make it. All was going great, and as I got to the halfway mark of the trail to Salter's Lake, I branched off to my left. It was an open area, and the trail doubled as an access road for the park services. Part of me wanted to just stay on the main trail, keep it short and sweet. I really should have listened to my instincts as I veered left and headed deeper into the forest, not knowing what waited for me at the end of the trail. The dogman had been in his new territory for a few weeks, having dug himself a new den hole under the upturned roots of an old oak. He had settled in nicely with a lake for drinking water and plenty of small game to keep it fed and entertained. He was stalking a deer not too far from his new home when the wind changed direction. Carrying his scent right to the prey, sending it bolting away. He let out a growl in frustration, preparing to give chase, and when it took a sniff, wiped his head around to face the wind. The human was here. When I reached the end of the trail, there was a picnic table. Fire pits and logs in a small clearing, just a few yards from the water's edge. My knee was hurting pretty bad by now, and so I decided to stop for lunch and take a load off. It was lunchtime anyway, and I would need something on my stomach to go with the painkillers I had brought. I built a fire for nothing more than the warmth of it, pulled my sandwich out as well as one of the sports drinks, and sitting on the table facing my fire, my spear sitting on the table next to me, it was quite peaceful. I was almost done with my meal when I noticed something. It had gone quiet, too quiet. My eyes widened and I scanned the area. And though I was surrounded by forest, it was fairly open and I had a long field of view. Oh no, not again. My heart raced as I tried to figure out what it was that caused everything to go so quiet. Coyotes. A bear. Or was it something worse? I wasn't waiting around to find out. After putting out the fire, I gathered my things and unsheathed the spear, heading back down the trail as quick as I could. There were some places that were a bit of a worry, as the trail was narrow and the brush was thick, making it hard to see anything coming until it was right on you. The upside was that there was too much debris for whatever it was to sneak up on me, and I would stop at any time I heard a noise. Now and then a branch would snap, or I think I heard a growl or sniffing. And when I turned to face whatever it was, there'd be nothing. I managed to make it back out to the main trail, taking a moment to catch my breath. The dogman had passed his den. Oh, for fuck's sake! I managed to make it back out to the main trail, taking a moment to catch my breath. The dogman had passed his den and located a human sitting on a table. Temptation built, as all he could do was not charge right there or let out a howl. He had made that mistake before, but this time he was going to stalk and take him by surprise if he could. Every time he would get close, the human would seem to sense his approach and turn with that damn spear. He hated that spear. It had been the thing that almost killed him last time, and so he was wary of it now. Come into the edge of the thicket, there was no way to ambush him now. It would be a short run to take him down, but it was enough time for that weapon to be pointed its way. He watched and waited for an opening, but eventually eagerness and pride got the better of him as he stood up on his hind legs, and walked out into the clearing and let out a howl of mighty proportions. Standing in the middle of the wide dirt road, I panted and rubbed my aching knee. 
The meds and adrenaline that had helped me out power walking over the rough path had taken its toll. Whatever it was that was following me seemed to be holding back inside the tree line. I looked down the trail and knew that the hiking path would go down into the woods again. It's something I was not going to attempt. No. Instead, I was going to stick to this wide road until I made it out of the highway at the far end. And from there, I could hitch a hike back to the park and get my car. As a last resort, I could call the rangers for assistance. And to be honest, I probably should have just done that to start with. I didn't want to endanger their lives if I didn't have to. There was always the chance that it was just some normal critter checking me out of curiosity. That thought was shattered when I looked up at the horrible beast stepping out of the wood line. Our eyes locked for a moment before it raised its head and let out a long howl. Oh no, not it, not again, I muttered, frozen in fear as I knew there was no way I could outrun this thing. I was in for a fight for my life once again. Fighting for my life against the Dogman. Once again, I found myself in the middle of the forest, far from help, standing face to face with the Dogman. I knew it was the same one I had fought before, as it only had one eye, and there was a scar on its side, right where I had stabbed it with my spear. I turned and faced the beast, pointing the spear at it and taking a bracing stance. And when it saw this, it roared and dropped to all fours, slowly making its way towards me with its fangs bared. The closer it got, the more I had to scrunch my nose at the smell of wet dog, urine, feces and death wafted my way. Come on now, let's not do this, I said, once again giving it a chance to call a truce, and responded with a low growl. I took a deep breath and tried to steady my shaking hands. I knew I probably wouldn't get out of this so easy this time. I might even die. It stopped its advance just a few feet from the end of my spear and began circling me. I never let it get an advantage as I sidestepped and followed its movements. And when it would swipe at me with its claws, I would jab at it to keep it at bay. Neither of us given up any ground. Just then there was a loud boom and the creature yelped. We both looked towards where the sound had come from and there was a park ranger with a shotgun in hand. His eyes were wide with shock as to what he was looking at and he worked the action for a second shot. With the dogman distracted, I arched back and brought the spear down hard, trying to run it through, but it saw me just in time to dodge my attack. Still, it took another slug from the ranger's gun, turned from me and bolted towards my would-be rescuer. A third shot was fired, but the gun was knocked away before the trigger was pulled, smashing it against the bedrail of the truck. Now, the monster stood on top of the squirming man, raking him with its clawed hands and biting down onto his face. All I could do was watch as it jerked its head from side to side, ending the screams of pain and fear coming from the poor man. I took this time to duck into the tree line and hide behind a fallen pine. I hoped that I could make it to the truck and use it to get the hell out of here. As soon as the deed was done, it turned to face me once again. It's more covered in blood. A confused look came over it as it hadn't expected me to be gone. It let out a snarl in frustration and went to where I had last been and started sniffing. I eased through the brush, trying not to make a sound until I was aligned with the open door of the truck. It sniffed out my previous hiding spot and bounded over the tree, hoping to land on me given an aggravated snort when it saw that I wasn't there. And with it now in the woods, I sprinted towards the truck, making it as far as the door before I was impacted from behind. The dogman grabbed me, digging its claws into my shoulder and sighed, its teeth finding my shoulder. I screamed in pain, but was in no position to resist. Suddenly, there was a feeling of weightlessness as the ground vanished below me and I was thrown away from the vehicle, slamming. Into the ground I rolled and gasped for breath as it was knocked out of me. It took me a moment to get my bearings as I scrambled to find my spear, my only means of defence. When my hand gripped the pole, I turned to see where the beast was, and it was on me, slashing my chest and rolling me again. Using the momentum, I was up and jabbed with the spear, just missing its throat as the blade buried itself into its shoulder. It roared and bounded back, 
lifting its injured limb and growling in anger. I crawled back away, blood now leaking from my wounds. I was running out of energy. Panting hard, I settled back against the tree, doing my best to hold the spear up in defence. Time is running out. The dogman paced back and forth, watching his prey grow weaker by the minute. He had gotten a taste of blood, and he wanted more. The human was too weak to escape, but he wasn't taking the chance. He would wait until his foe couldn't fight back before striking a finishing blow. It was only a matter of time. Finally, the spear dropped, and the human's head slumped to the side. He licked his lips and charged forward, not taking any chances, and would make it in a quick kill. Leaping forward, he opened his jaws wide to taste the human's flesh once more. I watched the beast as it kept its distance. I knew what it was waiting for, and I didn't have it in me to get up and take the fight to it. I had to think of something to end this fight, or I wouldn't make it. But what could I do? A tear rolled down my cheek as I thought about my family and my friends. They would probably never know what had killed me. If my body was ever found at all, that is. If only I had killed it the first time. If only I hadn't taken that first camping trip. If only. If only. Darkness started to creep in, even though I knew it was still hours before night. I was growing weaker, and eventually I couldn't hold up anymore. My arms went limp, and I dropped my head. Now! My voice in my mind screamed, and my head shot up in time to see the beast leap forward. Up came the spear, the blunt end digging into the base of the tree. A look of shock came across the dogman's face as the blade pierced its chest, running right through its heart. It let out a and kicked away, taking the spear with it as it fell back and tried to pull it out. Blood spurted from its mouth as well as the wound, and eventually it didn't have the strength to move any more. I stood, summoning all of my strength and will to make my way over, trying my best to ignore the pain. Rolling the creature onto its back, I grabbed the pole and pulled the spear out. Lifting it with my good arm, I rammed it down hard into its neck, repeating this until the head was removed. I weakly kicked it away, dropping my spear and stumbled over to the truck. My phone had been smashed and so I hoped there was a radio. There was, and I sent out an SOS, given my location, and hoped that they would get here in time. Once again, I found myself waking up in the hospital, bandaged wraps covering my entire torso. My mother and brothers were there, as well as a few friends, including Becca. I was glad to see them, and broke down for a moment, thanking God that I had lived through another bout with the Dogman. Fighting for my life in the Appalachians. Let's get straight into that. The Long Road to Recovery By the time the first responders and paramedics got to me, I had already passed out. Now, according to the report, my heart stopped while they were preparing me for the transport. I was resuscitated, and a helicopter was called in hopes of getting me to a hospital a bit quicker. Twice more, I tried to slip away, once on the chopper and again in the operating room. But both times, I was brought back. The irony is that if I had been in shape, I would have died for sure. The extra padding and thick jacket that I was wearing had helped it had been a loss of blood that nearly did me in, along with the slashes and bite marks. I had three broken ribs, a dislocated shoulder, and a slipped disc. Well, it was going to take a long time to come back from this. I was lucky to be alive. I had been unconscious for a week before. I woke up to the sight of my family and friends. And some of them were asleep in chairs around the room, and others were talking quietly. Hey... I said weakly and tried to sit up but couldn't. What well, parts of me that didn't hurt were stiff and so I just gave up and remained lying down. All eyes were on me and a flurry of commotion erupted as most rushed to my side while others went to get a doctor or nurse. 
I was poked and prodded to be sure everything worked all right, and then the questions started. I answered them as best I could, but claimed to not remember what had happened. I wasn't sure yet what they knew or thought they knew, and I didn't want to sound like a raven lunatic. Visiting hours ended and everyone was ushered out, and so I could get some more rest. Not long after they had gone, a knock came at the door, and an older man stepped in. He introduced himself as Agent Smith, as if that wasn't suspicious at all, and claimed to be from the Department of the Interior. I have some paperwork for you to sign, if you don't mind. He said and pulled a folder from his inner coat pocket. I raised a brow at this and took the documents labelled Incident Report, followed by my name. I opened the folder and read through, stopping at the listing for what species had attacked me. Black Bear. At first I didn't know how in the hell they could be mistaken, that creature for a bear, but then I saw the photos that had been taken. It was indeed a bear in the pictures, but I knew that that was not the thing that I had killed. When I looked up at Agent Smith, I got the feeling I didn't have much of a choice but to sign off on this blatant lie. It was an obvious cover-up, and I didn't want to think about the consequences of refusing to go along with it. And so I let out a sigh, and shaking my head as I signed and dated the report. I'm assuming you still have it, I asked, handing him the document. Officially, I have no idea what you're talking about. We don't keep the remains of hmm, bears, he said with a slight sarcastic tone. After record, he said with a cocky grin and a wink, I like to say I'm impressed that you managed to kill that thing with nothing but a spear. He shook his head and started for the door. If there's anything a DOI can do for you, you just give me a call. Here's my card, he said, setting one down on the end table. You sent me the bastard's teeth, or better yet, make me a coat. I called out to him as he closed the door. I could hear him laughing as he started down the hall. It would be several weeks before I'd even be able to leave the hospital. Once I was home, it was more of the same. Laying around, watching television, playing video games and doing physical therapy. It wasn't all bad though. With a strict diet I was on and a constant exercising, I slimmed down quite a bit. It also gave Becca and I a chance to get to know one another, and we hit it off as more than friends. She didn't care that I was broke physically and financially. All she cared about was that I treated her well, and in return she was good to me. I was bittersweet though, as she was called away to stay with her alien grandmother, who lived in Oklahoma. Neither of us liked the idea of a long-distance relationship, and so we ended things on a good note and remained the best of friends. Now the slip disc was my biggest concern. It hurt too much to do the things I normally did on a day-to-day -day basis. This meant no heavy lifting or straining, and walking more than a hundred yards was all but impossible without a break. The worst part of it all was having such a hard time walking after so much downtime. The handfuls of medication I had to take, or even the bills that had me drowning in debt with so little income. No, the worst part was that my wilderness adventures were pretty much over. Even after the slip disc had healed or was operated on, I just didn't know if I could go out into the deep forest again. Monster in the Mountains Lisa and Caroline had been friends since elementary school. They had grown so close that they were more like sisters and were rarely apart for more than a few hours at a time. One was always sleeping over at the other's house, and often they would go out camping in the woods near the neighbourhood. They were at the end of their senior year of high school, and both had gotten accepted into the same college. Well, to celebrate, they planned to go out on one more camping trip before they got busy with classes rather than partying like the rest of their classmates. 
Lisa made it there first and started getting things set up. And with tents up, the fire going and supper on, she set out to gather more firewood. On her second return trip, she checked the pot of soup and wondered what was taking her best friend so long. And just as she pulled out her phone, she scrunched her nose at the smell of something foul on the wind. And looking around, she didn't see anything. She hoped that the stench wouldn't persist or they'd have to move camp. Hey girl, where are you? She typed and sent the text before slipping her phone back into her pocket. It was then that she was slammed from the side, knocking a breath out of her as she rolled to the ground. And there was a searing pain when she touched her side. It, it was warm and wet. Then, looking at her hand, she saw that it was covered in red. Her own blood. What the fu- She started to say and then saw what had hit her. It was a tall, lanky creature with pale skin that looked to be too tight for its form. It had hooved feet, long arms and clawed hands. But the worst part about it was its head. It looked like a misshapen deer head and with a mouth full of sharp teeth. She screamed and scrambled to get to her feet, but the Wendigo was faster and hit her again, goring her with its antlers and throwing her through the air. She landed hard on the hood of her car and rolled off to the other side. Again, she was gasping for breath and coughed, spitting blood onto the ground. Desperately, she crawled further down the side and slid under her car, just as the monster came around to where she had landed. It circled the car and, as bad as she wanted to scream again, she held it in and clapped her hands over her mouth. It let out a screech and bumped the car, but still she remained quiet. After circling the car a couple more times, sniffing the ground and growling, it trudged off slowly into the forest. As quietly as she could, she pulled out her phone, but it was smashed. Fuck, she whispered, tears now rolling down her cheeks. She cried herself to sleep, not daring to come out of her hiding spot for fear of meeting that thing again. And a couple of hours later, she woke to the sound of the car door shutting. Lisa? Caroline called. I'm here. Why aren't you answering your phone? She said. Lisa started to speak up when a monster came charging out of the woods and rammed Caroline with its horned head. The girl yelped as she was pinned to the side of her own car. It grabbed her and held her in place as it lifted its head. Lisa couldn't distinguish between her friend's screams and the monster's. It seemed to draw Caroline's soul from her body in a smoky wisp before biting into her neck and impaling her with its claws. Lisa could only watch in horror as her best friend, her sister, was torn apart and devoured. Once the Wendigo was done, it grabbed the dead girl's leg and dragged her remains into the forest to finish eating later. A pleasant surprise. With everything that had gone on, I had forgotten about my own birthday. That is, until the late surprise party that was sprung on me. My fights with the DM had been at the beginning of January, and my birthday at the end. It was now later in the year, and I was truly surprised. As I made my rounds, thanking people and shaking hands, I came face to face with someone I hadn't expected to see. Agent Smith, what are you doing here? I asked as we shook hands. Please, call me John, and I'm off the clock. He replied with a smart-ass look. Right, John Smith. <laughs> Should have known. I said with a chuckle. Why are you here, John? I asked again. I came to give you this. He replied with a cocky grin. I couldn't get authorization to fill your order, but with the DOI thought that this would be a good substitute. 
he said as he handed me an envelope. Inside was a copy of my medical bill with a remaining balance of zero dollars. When I looked up to thank him, he was gone. No one else seemed to have noticed him. If not for his gift that I still held in my hand, I would have thought I had imagined the whole thing. And the rest of the party went well, ended with me being given a card signed by everyone. And with it came all expenses paid vacation to a resort in the Appalachian Mountains. And given my previous experience with the great outdoors, I was a bit hesitant about taking the trip. Oh, come on now. It's a resort. What's the worst that could happen? I thought to myself. What a dumbass thought that was. Massacre in the mountains. It was three days before anyone came looking for Lisa and Caroline. A day later than they were expected to return. That whole time Lisa had remained under her car, too afraid to come out or even move, other than to make dressings for her wounds. She didn't eat or drink anything, and barely slept. And when a search party came and found her, she fought them and tried to stay under the car. In the end, she had to be sedated and was taken to hospital. And she was treated for the wounds she had sustained and the malnutrition, dehydration and shock. The latter had rendered her speechless and mostly unresponsive. And when questioned about what happened, she would only scream and hide under the bed. Now as for Caroline, well... Her body was never found. The trail went cold when it came to a river, and the bloodhounds refused to even try to continue the search for her. It was the weirdest thing the search and rescue team had ever seen the dogs act like. The dogs were trained professionals, but they just whined and hid under the truck. I always hoped that this incident would be a one-time occurrence, but no one really believed that it would be. And in the weeks that followed, six more people vanished, including one of the search and rescue members that had strayed away from the group. All that was found of him was his radio, which was smashed and covered in blood. The access roads to the woods were closed soon after. Residents that lived off the beaten trail were asked to seek refuge in town, but it wasn't made mandatory. The ones that chose to remain in their wilderness retreats did so at their own risk and for the most part, they were all fine. Well, one family wasn't so lucky though. Their 13 year old twin boys, Ashton and Roland, were supposed to be in their room while their mother took a nap. And Nancy was a nurse and was coming off a double shift and Bill, their dad, was trying to fix his four wheeler in the closed garage. He had music playing, otherwise he would have heard his boys slip out of their bedroom window to sneak off to their fort in the woods. And the brothers hadn't been at the fort very long when they got the feeling that they were being watched. Oh, it was quiet, too quiet. They remember their dad saying something about when it got quiet in the woods, the danger was nearby. But boys being boys, they went on playing anyway. Well, Roland was inside the fort playing the defender while well, Ashton was outside, acting out the part of the attacker. Immersed in their game, they had forgotten the feeling of danger. That is, until Roland watched his brother vanish before his eyes. Something large rushed across the clearing and hit Ashton hard, carrying him off and away. He never even made a sound. One of the creature's horns pierced his heart on impact, killing him instantly. Roland hid in the fort and silently cried. He knew his brother was dead. He knew it was his fault since it was his idea to sneak out in the first place. As the sun started to go down, he realized he had to get home. He had to tell his parents what had happened. And so quietly, Roland came out of the fort looking around for any sign of the creature. Then, moving quickly, he started back down the trail heading for home. Roland? Ashton? He could hear his parents calling and tears welled up in his eyes as he took off running in their direction for their voices. 
As he rounded the last bend, he saw his dad and felt a sense of both dread and relief. Roland? Where have you been? Where's your brother? Bill was cut off when he was slammed from the side. Bill groaned in pain as he rolled, unable to recover before the Wendigo set upon him, slashing with his claws. Roland screamed when he realized that this thing had followed him home and was now savaging his father. His mum had seen it too and rushed to grab up her son, taking him inside the house and slamming the door shut. And she hurried the boy to his room and into his closet, setting Roland down in her lap and they curled up together. Where, where's Ashton? She asked in a whisper, already sensing the answer. Roland could only shake his head as tears welled up in his eyes. They both cried as they huddled together in the darkness for what seemed like hours. Both heads shut up when they heard a knocking at the front door, followed by a muffled voice. Sheriff's Department, said the voice. Nancy got up. Stay here. I'll be right back, she said. And she stepped out of the closet, shutting the door behind her. Roland could hear her leave his room and make her way down the hall into the living room. He eased out of the closet and was at the top of the stairs when his mother opened the front door. While there was a short pause, followed by his mother saying, Hello? As she stepped out onto the porch, after a moment of silence, Nancy screamed. There was a crash that shook the house, a rustling on the porch, more screaming and a final screech before it was suddenly deathly quiet. As soon as it had all started, Roland hit the floor and crawled under his bed. He remained as quiet as he could and listened to someone or something entered the house. Uh, there was a knock. Sheriff's Department came the same voice as before. It wasn't just that. It was the same voice, though. It was the same tone, almost like a recording. A few more steps and... Sheriff's Department, the voice said again, and still, Roland didn't move or speak. Come out, honey. It's okay. A woman's voice chimed in, soft and sweet. But it wasn't his mother's voice. Then it stepped into his room, its grotesque form hunched as it was too tall to stand. Its mouth opened a little. Sheriff's Department, the voice came once more. Oh, this terrified Roland so much that he made a fatal mistake, letting out a terrified whimper. In a flash, the bed was flung away and he was dragged, screaming from his room and away from his home. Checking in. It was a couple more months before I was well enough to go on that mountain vacation. When I was finally ready to go, I packed everything I would need, going over the list to be sure I wasn't forgetting anything. Satisfied, I slung the bag over my shoulder and started out my bedroom door. My free hand reached out and grabbed my spear, causing me to pause. Why had I done that? Surely I wouldn't need it, right? I gripped the pole for a moment in thought, then, letting it go, I left it behind. Or at least, I tried. After depositing my bag into my car, I couldn't help myself. I went back in and retrieved my spear. Removing a blade on the way out, I stuck it in my pack. I knew I was going to look like a looney tune showing up with that, but frankly, I didn't care. That spear had saved my ass twice already. And while I wasn't expecting to run into any trouble, it was better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. I had my pistol and the muzzin was still under the back seat of my truck, but I still just didn't feel right without my trusty spear. And the drive was a bit long and I had to leave real early in the morning. Yeah, it was well worth it though, to just get away for a while from the mundane existence that had become my life. When the resort wasn't what I expected, I thought it would look like a typical modern hotel. Instead, 
On the outside, it looked like an oversized log cabin to fit in with the surroundings, I suppose. And the inside looked like it had been cut straight out of a magazine, but somehow still kept that log cabin feel. To say that it was nice would have been putting it mildly. According to the fire evacuation sign, it was a large commons area for guests to share. It had a kitchen, dining room, lounge and library. And there were 18 regular guest rooms, the honeymoon suite and the master suite, all but their own bathrooms and luxurious furnishings. Hello, how may I help you? Came a woman's voice, interrupting my train of thought. I looked over to her with a smile and said, I have a reservation, giving my name and showing her the voucher. Oh yes, we've been expecting you. I'm Jane and if you need anything else, just uh, just ask. She said and retrieved a key from behind the desk. She then led me down the hall to the last room on the left and opened the door for me and then handed me the key. Uh, breakfast is from 5 to 8, lunch from 11 to 1 and supper is 6 to 8.30. And there's unlimited coffee and apple cider in the lounge and a snack bar to the left of the library. Hope you enjoy your stay. She told me and then left me to settle in. Well, the first couple of days I mostly stayed inside and around the resort, chatting with other guests and hanging out in blissful comfort. And there were great views in all directions. Well, I was starting to get over my fear of going into the forest and the hiking trails were calling to me. I had also got caught up in a book I found in a library which described creatures of myth and legend. It was an interesting read and even described the dogman to which I was uncomfortably familiar with already. Sitting at the table outside with a cup of hot apple cider, I thumbed through the pages, skipping to the end. I stopped on a hand-sketched image of a creature straight out of your worst nightmare. I had the body of a man but was tall and lanky and with the feet and head of a deer or elk and long claws on its hands and the chapter was titled The Wendigo. Ah, this creature I had heard of before but mostly in vague references. It was said to take different forms depending on the location in which it resides. The form was usually some species of deer but not always. It showed sketches of different versions some more human-like and others with animalistic heads and features. The worst ones were said to be women who turned after eating their own children. These were also thought to be the rarest form and remained human-like in appearance. This kind lures people by acting like a damsel in distress. They will sit there crying pitifully until someone comes along to help and then when its unsuspecting victim is close enough, it will strike. This kind of reminded me of the witch from the Left for Dead games. While the Wendigo is a full-on carnivore, some believe that it is not only consuming one's flesh but also their soul as well, trapping its victim's life force within itself. This allows it to live far longer than most other cryptids. And this theory stems from the loss of its own soul by acts of the greatest betrayal meaning cannibalism. The more I read, the more I grew to despise this abomination. And sure, a dogman had tried to kill me and they were larger and smarter than wolves, but at the end of the day, it was just an animal. The same could be said about some of the other cryptids, but this thing, it was pure evil. Fool me once, shame on you. I marked the page to finish reading later, as I wanted to see what other creatures the book talked about. It was then that a family came out onto the deck and set up a few tables. It was a mother and father and their daughter, who was in a wheelchair. Lisa, Lisa, Lisa honey, would you like some tea? The older woman spoke and the girl gave a very faint nod. The father nodded and headed back inside returning with three cups. I smiled and nodded to them. When they noticed me, and they returned the gesture. Uh, may I ask what happened? I asked curiously, nodding to the girl, Lisa. Her parents looked at each other, and then to me. Ah, uh, she, she lost her best friend in a camping accident, and she hasn't spoken since, replied the father. 
Ah, I had a couple of those myself. Well, actually, accident might not be the right word in my case. Actually, I was attacked while out camping in the forest, I explained. Lisa turned to look at me, and when our eyes locked, I felt a connection, and without thinking, I lifted my shirt. Ah, uh, dogman, I said unconsciously. Well, her parents' reaction was a mix of shock and then anger at my revelation. But Lisa seemed to understand to some degree. M- M- Mon- Monster? She stammered and her parents' jaws dropped. Well, I like to think it was an animal, do what animals do, but as you can see, it just so happens I came out on top. Uh, barely, I replied. Yeah, she shook her head and lifted up her own shirt and showed me her bandages. And then she repeated in a more fearful tone, Monster! Monster! Before I could inquire as to what Lisa meant, her parents began showering her with praise and affection. It was obvious they were hoping she would continue to speak, but all that did was cause her to clam up again. Not wanting to interfere or make matters worse, I decided it was time to leave and wish them a good day. I'm not sure what she meant by monster, and it bothered me that I hadn't been able to get the details. Could it have just been an animal, or had she had a run-in with a cryptid? Could it have been a dogman? Or even a gugway? On top of not knowing what happened, I hadn't found out where it had happened either. If I had known at the time that they were locals in town visiting their cousin Jane, I wouldn't have done what I did next. Thinking that they were guests from some far-off place, I figured it was safe enough here for a little adventure. After all, what's the point of going to the mountains if you're not going to go for a hike? And the next morning I got up, ready to get the day started. I was in a good mood, having all but forgotten about my conversation the previous day. Nor had I given any thought to the book. It was just cool enough for pants and a lightweight long sleeve shirt, so that is what I wore for my hike. After breakfast, I packed a few snacks and some bottled water in my now empty bag and headed for my room for one last thing. My spear. I slipped the blade into the bag and then headed out, telling Jane at the desk that I would be back around lunch. Luckily, it was already an established trail heading off into the forest and, according to the map, the path wound its way up the mountain and followed its crest for a ways until it came to a natural spring. The path continued to follow the river down, branching off with one trail continuing onto a lodge by the lake and the other looping back up to the resort. Naturally, I chose the shorter route as I had intended to only be gone for two or three hours. And this route was only a four mile or so round trip, whereas the other was closer to 12 miles one way. As I got down into the woods, I slipped my pack off and stuck the sheathed blade onto the pole. In a moment of inspiration, I tied a lanyard from the sheath to my bag. This way, if I needed to remove it, I wouldn't lose it. The uphill battle was rough, but the sights and sounds more than made up for it. I had always loved the mountains, and had hoped to one day be able to live there. I had reached the summit and was enjoying the view when I heard a voice call from somewhere downhill from me. It sounded like a child's voice. Uh, hello? I called back. Help me! came the voice again. Where are you? I asked and started off down to where the voice seemed to be coming from. Over here! Please, help me! said the child which I guessed was a young boy. I looked to where the voice came from, but I didn't see anything. I had passed the spring by this point, crossed the trail again and was almost to the river, but still I hadn't found the lost child. My mind began wondering how a kid made it all the way up here. Over here, please, help me, said the boy, but this time I froze in place. It was the same, the exact same. If that didn't set off alarm bells ringing loud and clear in my brain, the fact that it was otherwise dead quiet in the woods did. Oh, for fuck's sake. I muttered to myself, 
realising I had just jumped into the frying pan once again. Before I could retreat, I heard footsteps approaching quickly from my rear. I turned just in time to see that something was charging at me. I held the pole of the spear out to block the impact. It barely made a difference. Whatever it was, it hit me hard, snapping the spear shaft and sending me rolling down the side of the mountain. I honestly don't know how I managed to miss every tree and boulder on the way down, but somehow I did. And still, it hurt like hell. The sound of rushing water grew louder, and after a short moment of weightlessness, I splashed into an icy river. The current was strong and I was swept away, and unlike with my tumble down the hillside, I was not so lucky in the water as I was tossed about, hitting a couple of big rocks. And the water was so cold that I was too numb to feel the pain. The last rock hit me dead on in the face, and everything went black. Always hungry. After its latest attack, the Wendigo found itself with a scarce food supply. It seemed the humans here had gotten wise to it, and now it was time to move on. It crept through the forest as silently as it could, keeping an eye out for anything it could sink its teeth into. It managed to snatch up a squirrel here and a raccoon there, but basically anything that it could get its hands on was game. No matter how much it ate, it was always so hungry. Its stomach growled, and when it saw a lone man walking through the woods, it salivated at the thought of this unexpected treat. The human had a weapon that it hadn't seen in many years, one that the Wendigo himself had carried when it had been human. It was of no concern, though, and after finding a perfect ambush spot, it let out a call. The human responded the same way as they always did, charging headlong into the forest. It worked to draw the man deeper and deeper into the woods until it was time to strike. It charged forward and sent the human flying with ease. It chased the tumbling human down the hill but skidded to a stop at the edge of the cliff, watching its would-be mill disappear into the water below. It let out a shriek of frustration and headed down the stream to find him. But it was no use. The human was gone, and there was no scent trail to follow. When given up, it trudged off into the brush to seek out some other form of sustenance. Coming to some time later, I coughed, spitting up water, and I gasped for breath. Even though some parts of me were still numb with the cold, I could now feel waves of pain washing over my body. My shoulder was definitely out of place, my nose was broken for sure, and there was possibly a cracked rib. Oh, and my index finger was bent the wrong way. I reset my finger first, then my shoulder and my nose, taking time in between each one to recover a little from this necessary pain. By that, of course, I mean I cried like a little schoolgirl, and with that done, I checked my gear to see what I had left. The bottom half of my spear was gone, and, if not for the lanyard I had attached to the sheath, I'd have lost the top half as well. One of the bottles of water had burst and my snacks, they were crushed. My holster was now empty, which was a big loss as I really liked and currently needed that gun. I debated on whether or not to take a painkiller, because what I had with me was pretty strong stuff. Dull the pain and dull the senses or fight through the pain and keep a clear head. I chose the latter for now. I stowed what was salvageable and got to my feet, unsheathing the blade so I wouldn't be caught off guard again. I had washed up on a bank down the river from where I had fallen in, the water. How far was that, I questioned. I knew that if I followed the river back upstream, I'd find the trail and I could follow it out. The problem with that plan was it would put me back at the place where I had been attacked. I knew there was a fishing lodge at the lake, but the lodge could be around the next bend or several miles away for all I knew. I was getting dark fast, and so I figured my best bet would be to find some form of shelter for the night and 
make up my mind in the morning on what direction to go. And besides, I was soaked and freezing cold. Luck was on my side because I managed to find an abandoned mine that hadn't been sealed up tight. I wasn't sure what had been mined there, but I figured I could make it my overnight home. I gathered some dry wood and got a fire going with some waterproof matches that survived my dunking in the river. I stripped down to my boxes and hung everything else up to dry, and laid on a pallet of spruce branches I had gathered. And by this point, I was starving. I didn't care that the snacks were crushed and soggy. I ate and drank my fill, taking half of the pain pill while I waited for my clothes to dry. It was dark by the time I was able to get dressed again, and I didn't dare venture out into the night. I knew I probably wasn't going to get much sleep, and so I made a torch and explored a little ways deeper into the mine, satisfying a bit of my curiosity. There were old tools laying about, but everything was so rusted and corroded, I doubt any of it would have been worth taking. I caught a faint glint of a reflection down one of the tunnels and discovered an old moonshine still. Best part was that there were still a crate of jars full of liquid. I opened one and gave it a sniff, burning my nose with the odour. Oh, that's probably some good stuff, I said with a chuckle. I took the jar and carried them back to my camp and set to cleaning all of my little scrapes and cuts, which, just for the record, burned like hell. I had taken a sip reaffirmed my distaste for the stuff, but... It did give me an idea. I gathered some old rags that were lying about and turned most of the jars into molotovs. Then, still not quite tired enough to sleep, I took the blade off the pole and started whittling the ragged point of the broken end, using a stone to smooth it out. Satisfied with the fill of it, I put the blade and shaft back together and held it out. It looked more like a long-handled short sword. Realising this, I chuckled. Well, at least now I can make use of the swordsmanship lessons I took. I thought to myself. It had been a while, but I remembered the basic steps. Finally, I declared I had better try and get some rest. Letting the fire die down a bit, I laid on my makeshift bed, closing my eyes for what would be an uneasy slumber. Fool me twice. Shame on me. I woke up some time later to the sound of people calling out. First a man's voice, then a woman's. I sat up and listened closer. Now a third voice, a child's voice. After what happened the day before, I was a bit reluctant to call back to them. I stood by the entrance to the cave, half spear in hand, and waited. They seemed to get closer, but I couldn't pinpoint where they were. There were no lights, and they must have been on the trail of some kind, as I didn't hear any rustling brush or leaves. Then came the shriek and screams. It sounded like they were being attacked and I rushed from the cave and ran in the direction the sounds were coming from. Foolish as it was, I had to try at least to help them. When I entered the wood line, breaking branches as I did so, the sound stopped. Instantly, I dropped to the ground and rolled under a bush. That damn thing had tricked me again. I took a deep breath and held it as a hoofed foot landed just a few feet from me. Oh, the stench of this thing almost made me gag, and from where I was positioned, I got a decent look at it through the break in the branches. It was, as I feared, a wendigo. I had sniffed the air in the ground, clopping around as it searched for me. How it didn't find me, I honestly do not know. Maybe the smoke or spruce masked my scent. Whatever the case, I remained motionless, taking quiet breaths until eventually it left. Now I waited a bit longer, just in case, then slipped out to see if all was clear. I headed back to the cave and mentally kicked myself for doing something so stupid. But then again, that was just who I am. I reached the clearing where the cave entrance was, but I had a feeling that I was being watched. And stepping out cautiously, I raised the spear to a defensive position and watched for any sign of movement. When it came, it was so fast I barely had time to jump out of the way and roll to my feet. 
It was already on me again, swiping with a clawed hand. It was a wide swing, giving me time to counter with a block and then follow up with a slash to its side. If I thought this thing stunk on the outside, its black, viscous blood was worse than anything I had ever smelled. It screamed when I cut it, but otherwise didn't seem to be affected by my actions. Growling, it charged me again. I dodged to the side, avoiding its grasp and slashing its leg, and back again. Nothing. Not even a flinch. Now this went on for several minutes. I was starting to wear down. I breathed heavily and waited to see what it would do next. I had swung again and this time its claws met my blade and three of them were sliced off. Another scream, but this time it flailed its head, catching me with its antlers and throwing me into a tree. I fell, hitting a few branches on the way down, but caught myself on the last one. Dropping to the ground, I scrambled to find my spear, picked it back up and holding it out like a one-handed sword. The Wendigo snarled and approached slowly, half circling as it considered its next move. My attacks weren't doing enough, and I wasn't going to be able to keep this up for long. I might have been stupid or ballsy, but I jumped forward and yelled at it. I had bounced back like a cat and screeched. I took this chance provided and ran for the cave, diving in and smashing a jar by the fire. The brew set a light on the floor, making a barrier that the Wendigo wouldn't cross. It really didn't like fire. Good. I threw everything I had that would burn across the entrance, except the moonshine, since I might need it later. I had paced just outside, biding its time while I retreated deeper into the cave. When I came to a fork, I stopped to catch my breath. I set my bag and spear down in the left path and went to the right. I marked the wall with my urine like an animal marking its territory, making a trail a little ways in before going back to the other path. Eventually, the fire burned out and in came the Wendigo, as I knew it would. I saw it stop at the fork and sniff the floor. As I hoped, it took the right path. And once it was out of view, I made for the exit. Now the beams, they were weak from the fire, and so it didn't take much to break them and close off the cave, hopefully forever. I left the cave behind, finding a burned down cabin just up the hill. And sleeping at this point was not an option. I sat against the wall and built a new fire for light and warmth. I hadn't bothered checking my phone before, and since I was sure it had drowned during my river ride, but now I was curious. And so I pulled it out and surprisingly the screen came on. 3.34 a.m. was the time, but there was no signal. I started to put it away, but then I had a thought. What if the Wendigo got out? I couldn't fight it face to face again. I would be ripped to shreds for sure. And so instead, I opened a notepad app and started typing. I wrote to my mum and my brothers, a few close friends and backer. I even included a notation for Agent Smith, since I was sure he would get the message one way or another. And with that done, I put the phone away and laid my head back to try and rest. Exhausted, I was soon asleep again. I didn't dream. It felt more like a slow blink before I woke again. I felt a tugging on my foot. Looking down, I saw that a coyote was gnawing on my boot. I ain't dead yet. Get! I snarled with a swift kick from the other foot. The critter was sent yelping away. Now that the sun was up, I needed to get moving. I snuffed out the embers, ate what was left of my food, and headed off to find a way out of this godforsaken place. As I started to walk, I put my pack on my chest, hanging open with my moonshine molotovs at the ready. The one at the top had a match tied to it, and the striker was stuck to the spear pole. The going was slow, as I needed to be sure of every footfall. The sounds of the animals of the forest reassured me that I was relatively safe, but I wasn't taking any chances. I made it out to a cleared path. It was a relief, but I still had no idea where I was on the trail. 
I decided after some deliberation to go downhill and follow the river to the lakeside lodge. Travelling down was easier than up and gave me more of an open field of view. I had been walking for about an hour when I saw a wide break in the trees and the sun reflecting off the lake. I let out a sigh of relief but it was short-lived as I noticed that it had suddenly gone quiet. Shit, I whispered and pulled out the top bottle. A limb snapped and I froze on the trail, holding a bottle close to the spear, ready to light it if need be. My skin went ice cold as I heard the huffing sniffs and the all too familiar sound at this point. As the dogman stepped out onto the trail, my arms began to shake. This one, oh, this was nearly twice the size of the one that I had killed previously. It stopped and looked at me with a lack of concern, only bearing its teeth as a warning. Another one stepped out, smaller and obviously a female. There was more rustling as pups came into view, joining their parents on the trail. Now the big male growled at me, standing to its full height between me and his family. I knew that if I attacked, I wouldn't stand a chance. So why hadn't it attacked? Perhaps he was aware of the Wendigo and was trying not to draw attention to his family's presence. Figuring this might be the case, I did the first thing that came to mind. I lowered the bottle and the spear, kneeling in a bow of submission. What else was I to do? I heard nothing else and when I looked up, they were gone. Soon the sounds of the forest returned and I continued on my way, smirking to myself over the terrifying but strangely pleasant encounter. It was as I expected, they were animals after all, not monsters. I reached the lake a short time later, stepping into the open area of the park grounds. There were no cars in the parking lots, but the lodge would likely have a phone or radio. I went up to the building and tried the doors. Locked. With a sigh, I figured it was least worth a shot to check the windows. And I was in luck. One of them opened and I was able to crawl inside. Turning on the lights, I started looking for a phone and finding one in the lobby. I called 911 and reported myself as a lost hiker and explained that I had found my way to the lodge. I was assured that help would be on the way shortly and so I hung up the phone. Feeling a bit more at ease, I slipped the pack off and set it down at the front door. My stomach growled and so I went in search of something to eat. Raid in the fridge and the cabinets in the kitchen. And there came a knock at the door, followed by a muffled voice. Sheriff's Department. I breathed a sigh of relief, but when I rounded the corner into the main hall, I froze. The Wendigo was peering into the window. I lifted its clawed hand and tapped on the glass. Sheriff's Department. I heard it say again in that male voice. And then it rammed the door, busting the glass. I ducked into an office, shutting the door and pushing a desk against it. That thing finished ripping its way in and slammed against the office door, trying to get into the room where I was. I was trapped like a rat. Now we're cooking with gas. Well, this is just great. I groaned as I pushed against the desktop to keep it against the door. I looked around the room for something I could use as a weapon, or better yet, a way out. The scream it was making made it hard to focus, but was also a good motivator. The door began to crack in the middle, probably it wouldn't last much longer. And finally, I looked up to pray to ask God for help. His answer was swift as I noticed the ceiling tiles. This was a suspended ceiling. Getting up onto the desk and moving a tile, I poked my head through to see what was there. The A-frame timbers were within reach and I was able to lift myself up into the void above, and sliding the tile back in place just before the door gave way. I held my breath and remained still as the monster came charging in, ransacking the room in search for me. It let out a frustrated scream and then began to sniff around. I eased from one frame to another, then another. It seemed like it took me an hour to move just 20 feet. Lifting a tile, I looked to see that I was over the kitchen. 
I started to keep going when I noticed the stove. It was a gas-burning stove, and this gave me an idea. I eased myself down onto the counter and turned on all of the knobs. I could hear and smell the gas flowing, and so I opened the door to let it flow through the building. Back up I went with a few pots and pans. I had to keep it inside long enough for the gas to work its way around. I went to one room and dropped a pan. Oh, it didn't take long for the Wendigo to burst in and begin its search while I moved on to the next room. The last drop was in a room farthest from the front door, which is where I headed to as quickly as I could. And with the coast clear, I dropped down and grabbed my bag and went just outside of the door. I lit the Molotov and cocked my arm. Hey, asshole! I called and the beast stepped out into the hall. Burn in hell! I said as I threw it above the gas that had settled closer to the floor. The glass shattered over its head, spilling flaming liquid all over it. More importantly, when the flames met the gas, it ignited. I didn't see any of it though, as I had taken off running as soon as the bottle left my hand. The explosion blew the building apart and knocked the wind right out of me before I even hit the floor and eventually the tree. My ears were ringing and my body felt like it had been hit by a truck, but I was alive as I rolled over and looked over at the carnage. I got to my feet and rubbed my ears, futilely trying to get the ringing to stop. As they cleared, I could hear a gargled voice calling from the burning wreckage. The Wendigo crawled out by one arm, dragging its legless torso from the rubble. The flames had all but burned the flesh from its lanky, now brittle frame. It raised one of its clawless hands to me, its last defiant act before slumping to the ground. I remembered something from the book about how to dispose of one of these creatures, and so I set to work. Rubbing my hand in a rag, I grabbed its antler and proceeded to cut its head off with a spear. I threw the head back inside the burning building and then dug timbers over the body. Using some of the moonshine to get it burning again, I sat on the ground at the base of the tree and watched the fire consume everything. Soon enough, people started appearing in the burning rubble like wisps of smoke. It took me a moment to realize that they were the souls of its victims being released. They walked out towards me, more appearing as they left the flames. There were so many starting with early natives and colonial Europeans, progressing through the eras with men, women and children of all ages. It ended with its most recent victims, including a girl I assumed was Lisa's friend, and a family of four with twin boys. Thank you, they would say as they passed by and vanished. They were now free. Wow, 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 wow. Definitely another one. Wow. Absolutely awesome chest pounding and a tapestry of horror there from the incredible James Williams. Thank you ever so much, James, for uh, penning this and getting this over to me. Uh, I'm not bothered about the time scale, buddy. I'm just enjoying your work immensely. Um, I hope you do continue to write and uh, would love to uh, have an opportunity to narrate that in the future. As ever, guys and girls, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Of course, if you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack at things, please do get in touch with myself at the usual email as on screen, which is dmtfirstofear at gmail.com. I hope everyone's doing well and happy, keeping fit and focused during these testing times. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.